all of us will reach a crossroads in life, a decision that has to be made. Some can be small and insignificant. Others seem like they could shape the course of our entire lives. How can we know the will of God? How can we correctly choose the path He has set out for us? And what if we make the wrong decision? We spend sleepless nights and days filled with anxiety when we place these burdens upon ourselves. Often we become isolated, feeling completely alone in finding the right answer. Sometimes we're tempted to rush into a decision. Other times we'd rather delay indefinitely. But for those who call Him Father, for those who believe in the power of His name, He provides everything we need to follow His will. He gives us His word as a compass and inspiration. Those who live according to Scripture will always follow in His footsteps. He blesses us with wise counsel through His church and the leaders He has set in place. He hears our every prayer, granting peace and wisdom to those who ask. His very Spirit dwells in us, a still small voice that guides from within our hearts. And in His perfect timing, He will open doors. He will clear the way forward. And no matter the path you choose, you are never alone. He will walk beside you and enfold you with His love from now until the end of eternity. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Welcome, everybody. It's good to have you here this morning. I'm Pastor Rob, and I am delighted to be concluding our new vision series. Um, I don't know why it ended up going into February. There was some reason why, because I thought it was going to be just for January, but we're excited to conclude this today. Thank you for those that either came out yesterday to help us uh, with the warming center, donated to us, cooked for us, drove for us, dropped stuff off, prayed for us, or ignored us. Thank you all for that. Um, we were happy to partner with churches across our city yesterday, the mayor's office and different people. We had about 30 people here yesterday. And let's be honest, the place stunk. But it was a sweet aroma in the presence of God. To have our homeless brothers and sisters there, you, you just smelt everything from socks to, to, and it was probably me too, because I was sweating. You know, Pastor Eric and I did a 14-hour day yesterday, but we did it for the kingdom of God. And to see so many people come together to do the second part of our vision, love people. But while we were loving people, we were loving God, amen, because we were doing the greatest commandments to love your neighbor as yourself. And we were happy that at the end of the day, because granted, last night was still cold, Every single person got into, whether it was a, um, a shelter, a hotel, wherever it was last night, everybody that wanted to sleep in warmth did. I even had people texting me saying, hey, we found somebody at two, I can't remember the address, and because I was here, I was able to tech, text Nikki, and Nikki was able to send a police cruiser there to pick them up, bring them to the shelter. So we're able to work together in the city. The mayor was here seeing the construction projects we're doing, it was giving him more ideas on how to use our church. So we're just happy to be a conduit in the city, but all of it is for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So thank you guys once again for that. So I hope this series has helped us, inspired everyone to take small steps towards habits that will have a big impact over time. Every week it's been called New Beginnings and Something, but it was all to develop habits in our lives if you're not already doing them. If you're already doing it, giving you a fresh vision and wind and fire to do those things. The heart of the series is to be refocused and calibrate our hearts and our lives to the things of God. 
This series, um, the first week we talked about having a new heart. We looked at the story of the woman at the well. Week two, we looked at the story of Joshua and how the words God spoke, purpose, promise, and God's presence gave him strength in the most challenging times of his life. Week three, we talked about prayer and how we go to a loving God who knows and wants to answer our request. We kept saying the word persistence because God wants us to pray persistently. When there's something on your heart, you pray, pray, pray to the point you feel like you're bothering God, but you're not because there's power in the persistence. If you missed any of those weeks, there's no special thing because I delivered it, but go on YouTube, listen to them, get them in your spirit. Much like this Gatorade Zero, this service is brought to you by Gatorade Zero. You can find it in the green room. So you can find it on YouTube. Today, I want to end this series talking about new vision. Not just vision for your hearts and your lives and your families, but also for our church and our city. So today we're going to talk about the word vision. We're going to be in the book of Acts this morning, chapter 8 and chapter 9. I know some people like to get there. And like I told you a couple weeks ago when I said we were going to end with a, an altar call and we were going to do some business with God, today we're going to end with communion. Because I want you to be thinking in the light of Jesus during this whole service and as we end and we read some scriptures, I want it to come together as we read the scriptures and then we take and participate in communion together. So the whole service, you have time to prepare your hearts for communion. You don't have to be a member of Christ the Rock to take communion. You just have to be a member of God's kingdom. You just have to believe in Jesus and all he's done on the cross. Amen? All right. So vision is so powerful. Proverbs 29, 18 says... Where the people have no vision, they perish. So think about that in your life. We've talked about purpose and purpose and purpose. But what is God's vision for your life? God wants us to have appropriate vision, and vision is powerful. It's always fun to look into the future to see what could be. Maybe as a kid you had a crazy imagination. My friend Jeremy and I would sit in study hall in South Berwick, Maine, We'd look out the windows and he would say to me, Rob, what's beyond those trees? Now he's a small business owner in Minnesota. He's been a missionary to Afghanistan. He had an imagination and God used that. So even as young kids, Vincent and young students, vision, imagination, and God can use those things like we've talked about and other things. But vision isn't just for the dreamers of the world. We all want to look at our future, and I think I can speak for all of us that we want to have a great future. We have bride and grooms to be in our church, and I know they're thinking about their future. Valentine's Day, we'll talk about marriages future, marriages present, marriages past. Hey, maybe that's, that's the title of your sermon. We want a better tomorrow. We don't want to stay where we are. We want to make progress. As Christians, this involves God's plan for our lives. We can have all the plans. Listen, I wanted to go to Harvard and be a lawyer. I work in Fall River as a pastor. Much more rewarding than a lawyer. I figured you'd say that. Our resident attorney back there working in the sound booth. But I made plans for myself, and when I was on a mission trip in Mexico, God called me into ministry. So we can make our plans, but God has a plan for us too. And sometimes they do align. Sometimes we run from God, but then God always brings us back to his plan. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. Jeremiah says, In the womb I knew you. And he also said, I had a future and a plan and a hope for you. So if you feel like you have no hope, you don't know where to go, Pastor Rob doesn't have the answers, but the word of God does. And Jesus has a future and a hope for you. Amen? And if you already are secure in that future and hope, you should be sharing with other people the possibility of that future and that hope. Because we live in a world of hopelessness. Listen, Pastor Eric is a great wife, a great pastor. But when we got home last night, 
She even dreamed about the people that we worked with yesterday. She's like, the mind is so weird. I had, she works at a window manufacturing and she's like, I had some of the people that were there yesterday making windows and putting, helping us with the church. And I started to think about it in the office. The thing she was saying was, maybe that's a vision for the future that we're gonna be doing something, teaching them how to do trades and getting them off the streets. I don't know, but Pastor Erica, she has a heart for the homeless, like most people, but yesterday I could see it go a little bit deeper. She was remembering their names, their stories. Do you know the stories of the people on our streets? Do you know the stories of those hurting in your lives? Today we are looking at a story in the book of Acts. This is a story about the Apostle Paul. In the old school days, he went by the name Saul, and then it, later on, God changed his name to Paul. So when I say the word Saul or Paul, I'm talking about the same person, so that there is no confusion this morning. If you aren't familiar with Saul from the New Testament, he was a zealous Jewish man. He was obsessed with obeying Jewish law and traditions and making sure others did the same. Because of his zeal, he moved up quickly in Jewish leadership. In Saul's younger years, shortly after Jesus rose from the dead and the disciples started sharing the messages of Jesus, Saul showed opposition in Acts chapter 7. This is the, the chapter when Stephen was preaching the gospel unashamedly and they stoned him to death for preaching about Jesus. And Saul was there with his arms like this. Yeah, he deserved it. I'm glad he's dead. Now think about the, how messed up of a man that could be, that he was excited to see someone put to death not for stealing, not for doing this or that, but for preaching the name of Jesus. So this is not a good guy. Horrible person. But God had a plan. So think about the people in your life that you think are horrible people. Stinky people, smelly people, the people you read on the news and judge. We all do it. How could this person do that? Oh, I hope they get the book thrown at them. Until you're in the courtroom getting the book thrown at you like Pastor Rob was, you can't say you lived in their shoes. So be very careful how you judge people. Yes, we are to, be, to, to make sure their lives line up with Scripture. But I pray that more often than not, your heart breaks before your mouth judges. I think that's not in Scripture, but Scripture backs that up. All right, lost my place. So he was not a nice guy. Now we come to the story of Saul becoming a Jesus follower and his interactions with a man by the name of Ananias. We'll be in Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, I saw some get handed out. If you don't have a Bible, lift up your hand. We'd love to connect you with the Bible. We got one up front, please. Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. I like to use different translations. Right now, this would be the, the New Living Translation. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, on the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Now we're gonna to skip to verse three. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days 
and did not eat or drink. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time we have. We pray that you'll bless these short moments that we have in your scripture, Lord. We pray that it'll pierce our hearts, Lord. Lord, if you need me to change it up as I go, pray that I will preach what you want this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Jesus talks to this Christian, Ananias. This is an important part of the story. Look what it says. We'll go back to scripture. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. We're going to get the scripture all together, and then we're going to break it down. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, oh, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings and well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Here was Ananias' dilemma. Maybe you can already see what it is when Jesus was talking to Ananias. It didn't make sense to him. Why would Jesus have chosen Saul to be a leader in the church? Wouldn't he be the last person that could be used? Also, the second problem Ananias probably had is he just didn't want to die. Right? God is telling him to go to this person that is known that was part of stoning of Stephen. He also knows if he goes there and it's a setup, it's a trap, it's a sting, he'll get arrested and put in jail. So Ananias had a dilemma because it didn't make sense to him. As we jump into today's message, I'm going to give you my three points up front, and then we'll break them down. Vision doesn't always make sense or feel safe. Vision is made complete by obedience. As to Erica hit on this on, on Thursday night, and we don't compare notes much, so I was excited to hear that even this morning's devotional, things are coming together. Vision, the third place thing, ver, vision returns more than it costs. So the first one this morning, vision doesn't always make sense or feel safe. There are times when God asks us to do something that doesn't make sense. It could be as simple as being kind to your boss who isn't so kind. You might say, but he's mean. But Jesus says, love your enemies. It also says in scripture, they will know us by our love. But on Facebook, they know us by our judgments, our rules, our posts. So Jesus might tell you to love your boss, even though it doesn't make sense. For the teens, it might be, honor your parents. My mother-in-law always reminds me to honor her parents and in-laws. I was like, well, it doesn't say in-laws, but it does say parents. I'm like, okay, Pastor Kathy. And then she said, and it's with a blessing. So, nah, I had a joke, but I'll, I'm going to see her this afternoon because I think it's her birthday today. If you haven't sent her, no, her birthday is coming up. It's right around this time. I feel bad now that I don't know her exact birthday. Tomorrow, but we're celebrating it today at the Silva household. So, send her a text and tell her her son-in-law told you to send it. All right. But it doesn't always make sense to obey your parents. Ugh. But even the simple act of cleaning your room, there's a blessing there because you're obeying your parents. Those that are still blessed to have your parents around, honoring them in many ways. My mother always tells me, hey, I haven't talked to you in a week. So I try to put it in my calendar every week to call her, spend time with her on the phone because she lives a little bit further away. But honoring your parents is key too. Honoring their memory as well when they're gone. There are times when God could ask you to do something that is risky as well in your life. You might say, I can't afford to give my tithes and offerings this week. 
It feels risky. What if I don't have enough money at the end of the week to feed my family, to pay the rent, to pay the bills, to pay the heating thing? It doesn't always make sense. When I've sat with people over the last six months from other churches too that have heard messages and we've talked about tithing, like it doesn't make sense, Pastor Rob, I make $2,000 a week to right off the bat give this much money away to the church. I love what my church does, but that's a lot of money. I said, yeah, that's a lot of money, bro. I'm excited you make that much a week. And he's like, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then he started telling me about the blessings that God had. He goes, I wish I started doing this when I was a kid. So parents, train your kids as you give them, um, what is it called? An allowance. Thank you. Have them tithe off of it. Tithe to BGMC, Speed Delight, or whatever, however it is, however you want to do it. But show them at a young age. God might tell you to do something or talk about Jesus. He might tell you to change jobs or move. He told us to move to Fall River five years ago. That was a little risky, but here we are today. Yesterday we had, uh, it was crazy because we had the the warming center. We had James and Ron here too, patching up and doing some work. And then we also had an electrician here working. And the electrician came over, his name's Leo. He said, Pastor Rob, what are the rules with these people? I said, what do you mean? So I was thinking he found a needle in the bathroom or somebody was drinking. I tell them about Jesus? I said, yeah. You don't have to whisper about it, bro. He's like, can I get your two brothers over there and we'll, we'll pray together and we'll pray for the food? Yeah. I was excited. So we did that. We prayed. We let them know that we were there for them. We love on them all day long. A little bit later, over by the coffee station, instead of installing my lights, he was doing something much greater. He led a young man named Rob to the Lord right by our coffee station. And I don't, I don't know him that well, the electrician. He's a believer. But he seemed nervous to do it. He was kind of wanting Ron and James to come over and pray with us and this, that, and the other. But he stopped what he was doing. He was led by the Spirit. And now there's a man named Rob going to be in the kingdom of God because of his obedience. Now in the story, we see Ananias had a a situation where he could obey or disobey. Jonah had the opportunity to obey or disobey. We know how that ended up. We see other people. So we all have the option to obey or disobey. But what if Leo yesterday didn't obey God and leave Rob, Rob to the Lord? And Rob, God forbid, spent the night outside yesterday, which he didn't, he he was in a hotel, but was out on the street and passed away without knowing the saving knowledge of Jesus. See, your disobedience isn't always just on you, it affects other people, just like your obedience does as well, and we'll see that more in the story. Ananias was unsure, and he questioned, is it God? There's nothing wrong with questioning There's a problem when you delay, though. You can question, like I always hear um, people, they're they're doing a lot of cutting and stuff around the church, so measure twice, cut once, right? So I'm thinking, all right, pray twice, act once, right? But sometimes I'm like, all right, we prayed about it. I talked with with Brother Ron about it. I talked with my wife about it. I prayed about it. I'm going to pray about it again. I'm going to pray about it again. And then by the time you know it, it's been two weeks, and God's like, I told you two weeks ago to do this. See, delayed obedience is disobedience. When God's telling you to do something, he's showing you what to do and how to do it. There are times when God steps into our world and surprises us with something that might make us a little uncomfortable. We can ask, are you sure, God, in those moments? But God might be wanting you to do something. We might feel God speaking for us to confess, to serve, to go, to believe, to trust, to give, to work, or some other verb you can think of. It's not about does it make sense or is it safe, but is it God telling me to do that? Is it God? Does it line up with scripture? Does it line up with what God has been showing you? Then do it. What is God putting in front of you this morning, in front of your family, in front of your situation? What is his message to you this week, this month, or even this year?
Is there a risk involved? Maybe it doesn't compute, but is it God? That's how it was for Ananias. This could, this could be his life on the line. He was risking it all, going to see this man named Saul. Yet, it was God telling him to go and pray for Saul. Because Ananias knew it was God, he stepped forward despite his fear. When God gives you a vision, you need to trust him. Vision doesn't always make sense or feel safe. In the 1990s, I thought it was cool walking down Hampton Beach with my boombox and a cassette tape. Maybe it was a CD player. Listening to Petra, and there was a song called Beyond Belief, Beyond Belief. But it was taking a leap of faith without a net. And I believe God is asking some of you to take that leap of faith. What is God asking you, putting in your heart for you to do this morning? Maybe it has nothing to do with the church, but it's a min uh, something in your life. Maybe God's birthing in you to start a ministry here at the church. Maybe it's God asking you to volunteer here at the church. All my volunteers that are overtaxed said amen. Listen, as we grow, we'll have many hands because many hands make light work. But loving God and loving the city is tiring. So we need people to step up. So if God is birthing it in you to do something... I had someone say the other day, yes, we've had to make sacrifices for the church because we want to be here and do things, but they had the right heart and spirit, and God will bless them for that. Listen, everything has to be in balance, right? I wasn't saying that for any other reason, but it has to be in balance. You can't be here seven nights a week. Even Pastor Rob has to try to take a day off during the week, so I have to get creative. All right, God, you told me to take a Sabbath. Can I take a half a day Monday and a half a day Tuesday? Because Saturday is usually our day off, but we were here all day yesterday. So we have to get creative and unplug from church sometimes and even shut my phone off. Drives Connie nuts, probably. Vision doesn't always make sense or feel safe, was point one. Number two, vision is made complete by, dis uh, by obedience. This one might hurt a little bit this morning. Now, there's something pretty cool in here that is just one word, but it has an enormous significance in the story. Look back at verse 17. Here's what he says. He says, so Ananias went and found Saul. He laid hands on him and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias called Saul brother. Ananias calls him a family t term, even though he knew what this man had done to the family of God. Ananias could have drilled him with questions to make sure it wasn't a trick. He could have judged him. He could have just said, Saul. But he called him brother Saul. In Ananias' mind, this former persecutor is now family because of the grace of God. And Ananias went from worry and fear to complete trust in the word of God. It is okay to be nervous. It is okay sometimes to have a little bit of fear. But you give it to God and you stand on the word of God. And know if God has called you to it, he will see you through it. If God has given you the vision, he will enable you to complete it. And Ananias was obedient to the vision that God gave him. He was completely obedient. But how could he have had this kind of trust when the stakes were so high? To trust someone is to trust their judgment, their character, who they are at their core. When someone's judgment or character changes based on the circumstances, it hurts the trust. If our struggle is with trusting God, then we have to go back to be, remind ourselves who God is, that God is a good, loving, and kind. He wants the best for us, and he knows what is best for us. And how do we know those things? By having a relationship with him. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Religion is coming to church on Sundays, singing a song, putting something in the offering plate, and going home. Relationship is walking with God daily in his presence, 
We've been reading the word of God and Pastor Erica started a new group devotional and a lot of you jumped in on it. It's doing the devotions. That doesn't have to be done together, but it's being in the word of God. It's walking in his presence. It's praying, but it's also listening because he wants to talk. He wants to communicate with you. He wants you to know you are his best friend. Family of God, friendship with God. That's how you can know when stuff comes up, when God told you, if my dad told me to do it, there's no fear, I'm going to jump out and do it. Sometimes that's easier said than done. I get it. But stand on the promises of God that he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If my God healed yesterday, he will heal today, he will heal tomorrow. If he provided finances yesterday, he will today, and he will tomorrow when my MRI bill comes in. Right? We all have those stress and drama. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I don't have those stresses and dramas. I'm praying for the same exact things. But the enemy, so the enemy in contrast, he's trying to steal, kill, destroy. This morning, one of the devotionals, I do a few, talked about seeds and how prayer is part of faith. And faith starts out as a seed. But it also talked about so does fear, so does doubt, so does sin. Sin can start out as the smallest little seed. You can be the most pure guy in the world and you're going through Instagram. There could be a stupid ad for a game in a cartoon and it's a half-naked girl or whatever. That starts as a seed and if you don't claim it under the blood of Jesus, it can develop into other things. That's just one example. Just for me as the married guy, when I'm on Instagram, I see something like that, like Pastor Eric, look, look at this stupid thing right here. Like I just claim it right here. Look, look, look at this. We're friends with teenagers from years ago, and some of them may not be walking with the Lord, and sometimes they post things that they shouldn't put. Pastor Erica, look what she posted. That's just how it works in my home. It works for us. But a seed starts out in the negative and the positive. Faith, too. We've been praying for some crazy things. Some of you have been praying for things. God, and some of you, well, what if I pray? What if I fast and God doesn't answer it at the end of the 21 days? Keep asking, keep praying, keep believing. Because how much sweeter is it going to be when you give that testimony and you run into church? Pastor Rob, God answered my prayer. And God has been doing that all along, but I can't wait to some of you are so courageous and you want to get up and start giving testimonies. Be like an old-time Pentecostal service up here. Look what the Lord has done. Raquel was here. He healed my body. He touched my mind. If you don't know that song, you got to look it up. All right, listen. I listen to all kind of music. That's as close to country as I get. It's these truths about God in John 10.10. 10. Jesus has come to give us life not just life, but more abundantly. That's not saying we're going to be flying around in, in jets and Lamborghinis and having the newest everything. That's not what more abundantly means. More abundantly means a lot of things, but I believe more abundantly means your presence, you're joyful. People can tell you're a Christian that there's something different because the smile on your face, I never say the word right. What's the, the Portuguese saying when you have a kadunka? Is that the word? When you have a, a, a face that's just, ugh, karanka. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't have a kadanka. That sounds, that sounds horrible. I might edit this out on the online, but people should know there's something different because there's a smile on your face. You're living life abundantly. When someone says, yo, try, how you doing? Abundant, bro. Hashtag, hashtag abundant. It's these truths about God that should stir our faith to trust and obey. His vision for us might seem to be scary, and that's where Ananias was. His trust in Jesus was so strong that it overcame the fear that he had. God's vision for you this morning, whether it's small, big, for today or for the rest of your life, are you trusting him? Yes, it might seem risky, and oftentimes it goes against our nature of thinking. But if, in fact, is God, and God has trust us to it, we need to trust him like Ananias did. 
Obedience without trust is only compliance. Get that. Obedience without trust is only compliance. And trust without obedience isn't real trust. We need to obey with the right heart, and God will honor that. But having a heart that trusts God's goodness and acts on that trust is the kind of obedience that honors God. Vision is made complete by obedience. The last point, vision returns more than it costs. Because sometimes when we step out in vision, or when we step out in what God has told us, it costs us something. Whether it's the tithes and offerings the very first time, it's costing you something at the bottom line. You might not be able to go to Dunkin' Donuts as much, or go here, or go there. Or pay your bills, you think, until God provides it. But vision returns more than it costs. Back to Acts chapter 9, verse 18. Now remember, Ananias had come to Saul. He laid hands on him. And then it says, instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterwards, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with him and the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. Down to verse 22. Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proof that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Saul became an amazing communicator of the gospel. He didn't even go to Bible college. How could that pastor do that? He didn't go to my Bible college. Maybe you don't hear that as often as I do in my circles. I did go to Bible college, by the way. But it's an incredible story of redemption. And many of us are living a story of redemption. But God, where would you be today? But it cost something. It cost Ananias stepping out and obeying God's vision. He had to overcome his fear and his belief that Saul was not a good choice to be the church leader. He took the risk to trust and obey, and what was the payoff? That seed of obedience sown by Ananias would grow into fruitful ministry that is still going on today. Saul wrote a third of the New Testament. He was later renamed Paul. He would start many churches and give us the theology that we build the church on today. I bet you that Ananias had no idea that his trust and obedience would be so important to the story playing out today. Yes, his obedience cost him a little bit, but it would bring about a huge blessing. The ushers are going to come forward and get ready for communion. The worship team is going to come up. We're going to bring this sermon home now. The cost of telling the truth will reap the benefit of a trusted relationship. The cost of loving your spouse like Christ loves you will reap the benefit of a blessed marriage. The cost of forgiving will reap the benefit of freedom in your own heart and mind. Forgiving people even when they don't deserve it. If you forgive, and God is telling you to forgive, and you forgive, it will give you freedom that you will never understand because God will give that in your heart. The cost of obeying your parents will reap the benefit of blessings in your life. So this morning, what's God's vision for your life? It could be to start something. It could be to stop something. It could be something that will change the world or just for today. But it's time to trust God's vision, obey God's vision, and watch what God does with your obedience. The ushers are going to hand out the elements. Just hold them. We'll do it together at the end. Remember, partial obedience is complete disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. What is God asking you to do this morning? Listen to Paul's testimony in 1 Timothy 1.13. This is what Paul's saying. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of the Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. 
You and I have rebelled against God, and in return, God poured out his grace and healed us. We were all sinners dead in our sin until we accepted the grace, the love, the mercy of Jesus. For Ananias, it would be one small act of obedience that turned into one giant leap for the kingdom of God. But what if Ananias had disobeyed God or not done it? Yes, would God have probably found someone else to do his? Yes. But he would have delayed whatever God had going on. Maybe today you realize you need to respond to God's vision for your life. I challenge you this morning that there be no more excuses, no more delays. Your act of obedience may not make sense. It may not be safe in your eyes, but if you'll trust God, what you reap will far exceed what you could ever have imagined. Some of you have families that are hurting today. I can feel it. It's relationships. It's decisions that need to be made but haven't been made. I say again, no more excuses. Whatever God is asking you to do, do it and step out in obedience to him. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for every single person in this room. I just need a communion. Somebody could give the pastor the communion too. There you go. Just your touch. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. You're such a good guy. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice. I got it. I got it. Thank you. He died for us, but. Some of us just live like, like this doesn't mean anything. Like it's okay, Saturday night, we're gonna go out to the club, woo, woo, woo. Cause I can go to church tomorrow morning and God will forgive me. That's cheap grace, we're making God's grace cheap. To me, that's almost like spitting in his face or slapping him. But guess what? He's so gracious that he still looks through that spit and that slap and says, I love you, bro. Like Pastor Erica said, I got your back. But think about that. How many times would you do that if you had a friend that did that to you, treated you like that? But God's willing to do that no matter what. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. So it's not about how many times. Pastor Rob fell well more than seven times, ended up in jail, convicted, fell in all of those things. But, but God, by the grace of God, I was forgiven. And now I testify of what he's done. So when we come to communion, I don't want it to be just religious monotony that Okay, we do this, we'll do the Our Fathers, we'll go home, and that's it. It needs to mean something. If it doesn't mean something to you today, don't take it. Not my rule, but don't take it. It needs to. This blood, you need to realize the power. It's not in the grape juice that's here. If it's been here for years, it's probably wine by now. But there's no power in this cup itself, but what it represents. And what it represents is the Savior that went to the cross just for you. If you were the only person here, he would have done it for you. Jesus had vision. God had vision when he sent his son to the cross for this, for you. Vision that by his stripes we can be healed. So this morning, if you need a healing in your body, we will believe when we take this and when we pray, God will begin that healing. If you need healing in your mind, that God would heal it this morning. If you need healing in your spirit, you need healing in your marriage, you need healing in your relationships, you need healing at work. If you need a healing that I haven't even said, that by his stripes, you will be healed. On the night he was betrayed, he took the cup. It didn't look like this, but it, he had the blood and then he had the bread. Every church does it different with this, but the power is still the same. Jesus died on the cross for every single person here. If you are a believer, then you can take this with us. But remember his death for what it was. 
Father God, we, we lift up these emblems, Lord. We lift up your, your body and your, your blood symbolically, God, and ask you, Lord, to bless it. As we take it, God, in faith, whatever vision, Lord, whatever healing, whatever steps, whatever obedience, whatever disobedience we need to stop, you would make it real in us. You would convict us. You would work in us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Let us all take it with a clean conscience and spirit this morning. Forgive us of anything we've done today, this week, this month that's unconfessed. We confess it to you right now. We give it to you. We thank you that it's washed under the blood. And we take the body in Jesus' name. Take the body together. Same thing with the blood. We talked about it. So, Lord, we thank you for your blood. We take it now. If you need to claim a healing, claim it as you drink it in Jesus' name. Take the blood together. Thank him right now for whatever it is as you take it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for the healing. We thank you for the provision. We thank you for the breakthrough. We thank you. Like we sang earlier, a miracle can happen now, Lord. We believe, God, that the miracles that need to be transformed in our lives would happen today, now, throughout the rest of this week in service. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, God. Now, let me end with this verse. Thinking about the vision and everything we talked about today, thinking about healing, thinking about breakthrough, thinking about what does God want from me. It's a familiar verse, but we're going to read it in two translations. Ephesians 3.20. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think. The Message Bible says it's this way. God can do anything. You know far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. I asked you a few weeks ago, if God answered the prayers that you prayed this morning or last night, how would your life be different? If you're not praying for things that are in your wildest dreams, then you're not praying effectively. God has put it on my spirit that we will be a house of prayer, prayer, prayer. So I'm going to instill it in you every single week. Pray for what you want God to do and even what you doubt God can do. And I guarantee God will start building that seed of faith over and over and over again. Amen. Listen, this pastor loves you. Have a great Sunday. Join us downstairs for fellowship and we'll see you on Thursday. Love you guys.